Okay, great. <laughs> Welcome to the last uh, SOE seminar of the this uh, semester. Uh, I've been pleased to introduce some people I've been acquainted with for a while. Um, Ann Jopling, who has been a uh, hygiene officer at the board for several years and been doing, <laughs> been doing great work there from pretty much from day one. And uh, Robin Van Driel, who's a more recent arrival at the board, but uh, also a, and a graduate of our program here at uh, SOE when you graduated. Now the SPPH OEH theme. Uh, welcome to both of you and I'm looking forward to an update on what's happening in the construction industry, health and safety issues. Thanks, Ed. You can turn that one off, I think. Yeah. Um, Ed, Ed mentioned several years ago, our relationship goes back several years ago, but in fact, Ed, you realize that was almost 25 years ago. <laughs> <laughs> and we were both practicing in the trenches um, back in the day. Uh, it was probably about 25 years ago that we started to put our finger on the pulse of the construction industry. And at that time, the industry was not well equipped to uh, have controls and m understand characterizations of exposures. Um, and uh, so that was some of the early work that we did. And Ed was absolutely um, invaluable to WorkSafe at that time. He worked with uh, tool manufacturers back in the day. Um, helping them understand uh, shroud designs for grinders and other uh, tools that were being used in the construction industry uh, for dusty operations. Uh, Gagra equipment for a period of time out in Burnaby um, were um, uh, prepared to custom tool up shrouds for any size of grinder. It was unbelievable. So I don't know, Ed, whether you changed the world or, or whether then tool manufacturers began to, um, I think at that time, even 20, 25 years ago, there were researchers throughout um, mostly the United States, but also in England as well, and um, some of the Scandinavian countries who were beginning to recognize that construction workers were um, exposed to a number of a variety of uh, harmful, quite harmful exposures. Um, and these exposures weren't very work, well characterized. So um, we have benefited here at WorkSafe BC and um, over the last number of years, especially in the last, I'd say, 15 years, from researchers who care enough about the construction industry and are curious enough about the exposures that occur in that industry to start characterizing them, getting money through funding, through universities, through agencies like the Center to Protect Workers' Rights in the United States. And that's really benefited us because they've been able to characterize a, a lot of these exposures that occur in the industry, which are very difficult to characterize because there's so many variables, right, in the construction industry. Um, there, there's the dynamic nature of the industry, trades moving from site to site, uh, the scope and nature of work changing so, so um, uh, variably. Um, so there needed to be a lot of exposure data collected, and there has been for silica, NIOSH, Center to Protect Workers' Rights, HSE in the United States, for lead, Mount Sinai, the researchers at Mount Sinai studied the heck out of bridge and steel structure work. Um, housing and urban development studied a lot of um, sort of salvaging work and renovating work in homes and institutional buildings related to lead paint hazard. Um, uh, with respect to isocyanate hazards, IRSST, the um, uh, yeah the agency, the the, um, the equivalent, I guess, of WorkSafe BC and, and WorkSafe BC and uh, Montreal have studied um, a lot about isocyanate exposures. So. So it's given us the, the confidence, I guess, without sampling ourselves, to understand what controls are um, suitable and uh, the efficacy of those controls for many of these construction-related exposures that we're going to talk about. Um, so uh, maybe with um, maybe I'll just keep going. So that was sort of an introduction. I'm just going to let you know that one of the reasons we've been able to get as far as we have in the last 10 or 15 years with this topic is because we have, the, the construction industry came to WorkSafe BC about 10 years ago and said that they really wanted a dedicated team of claims and prevention staff working with them to, who could become better acquainted with that industry and with the nature of the work happening in the industry so it could become a better resource for them in a way. So it's allowed um, myself and others that have been um, on this specialized construction team for 10 years, my colleague Alana Nado at the back, the opportunity to really become acquainted with this industry and find strategies for working with them and getting them moving uh, in the right direction uh, sooner than later. Um, talk a little bit about the role and responsibilities we have, but really get into a focus on controls. And we're going to illustrate through three exposure um, uh, exposures that occur in the industry, silica, lead, and isocyanate, these concepts of basic uh, controls. Really, it's practicing industrial hygiene in the trenches. Um, 
it might be a little bit different than what you're exposed to. We're not researchers. Um, we don't really talk about exposure limits to construction contractors or uh, share, you know, research articles. We've distilled it down to the essence of control for them. Um, and we felt that was really the, the only and the best way to approach uh, this, to get this industry moving. And we've had quite a bit of success. We still have a long way to go. So if you have any interest in construction at all, I encourage you to get involved. We need hygienists supporting this industry. We have very few. We have safety consultants that are trying to get knowledgeable and provide service. We have hazmat consultants who come from asbestos backgrounds trying to engage in lead work and whatnot. But their skill set is different than the skill set that you have in terms of risk assessment and really um, being clear and concise about um, controls and in the training as well. Um, so Robin and I both work on a construction aligned uh, team out of the North Vancouver office. We're the only sector aligned team in the province and we represent the construction industry from UBC out to Maple Ridge and from the border with America up the coast, up the Sunshine Coast. And we've been able to provide uh, consultation and advice to our colleagues inspecting construction elsewhere in the province as well. There's two teams, a commercial team, a residential team. Uh, we have about 35 officers. Um, the six of us, actually we've got seven hygiene officers now, overlay all of that terrain, all of that parcel of land. So we're pretty lean. Difficult sometimes for us to work strategically when we get action requests all the time that need to be responded to, but we do our best. And we've been able to come up with some really good resource materials on lead abatement for construction workers, on silica, for example. The only other change to this slide is we actually have eight dedicated officers just dealing with asbestos issues of exposure in the residential sector as well. That's a big, big issue. And thousands of construction workers doing that kind of demo and salvaging are exposed routinely to, um, to asbestos. You probably know that we inspect. Do you know sort of a, a little bit about the role that we have? We inspect workplaces. We um, uh, initiate investigations. Hygienists, not, so much, not as much as the safety officers. We do a lot of consultative services. We, we get to know the, the stakeholders in this, um, in this sector. So we, we deal with, we work with con prime contractors who are the party responsible for and accountable to an entire construction site, all the dozens of sub-trades that are working on that site. The prime contractor has the role and responsibility to coordinate all that work. So we, we strategically uh, provide advice to that party in terms of what they need to be expecting from construction uh, trade contractors. Robin's going to be telling you about exposure control plans. I really encourage you to, if you haven't already, explore after Robin's talk more about exposure control plans because it's really every employer's tool to do their homework, understand these hazardous exposures, to consider all the factors that influence these exposures, to understand the controls that need to be in place and how they're going to maintain and sustain those controls through diligent adherence to training programs and uh, supervision and whatnot. Um, just briefly, we have a Workers' Compensation Act, a set of regulations. Um, I don't know how much you know about all of this business, but the regulations, we're only going to be talking about two regulations here today, Regulation 5.55 and 5.54. The section on controls that says if you're exposing, if, you're, if your work operation involves a potential exposure to something um, at, at levels, at certain levels, and in the construction sector, every, every task that involves a hazardous exposure is at that level. So um, they're all quite hazardous exposures that are occurring, uh, toxic exposures, and they're quite hazardous in the way, the scope and nature of the work. So, um, but there are other sections of part six around the asbestos and specific stuff about lead and specific stuff about uh, isocyanates. Part 12, which is our construct, construction section, um, or actually part 12 is tools and equipment. There's stuff around isocyanate spraying and whatnot. But we're just going to stick with part five. You, you might have only been, you might be familiar with 5.53 that says an employer has to characterize exposures. So we kind of bypass that one for the construction sector and we go right to 5.54 to say, to say you need an exposure control plan because those exposures are going to be high and you need to have controls following a hierarchy that looks like this. Uh, and we, we talk elimination and substitution and, um, but from a perspective of this industry, that, that really would involve architects and engineers and people like that 
the trade contractors and the prime contractors don't have a lot of opportunity to have influence over elimination and substitution. Just a little bit. Like lead, if they're using a chemical stripper, they have an obligation to seek out the least hazardous st uh, stripper. But it really depends on the nature of the resin and so on. So very limited. We're going to focus on engineering controls. Um, and we're going to simplify it by saying there's two ways to view this. It's not complicated engineering design, right, Ed? This is really trench work, really. It's source controls and it's containment controls. So it's can you, can you capture that contaminant at its source? And if you can, you must do that. Can you, if you can't do that, you're going to need to consider containment controls. It might be poly sheeting over doorways and putting in some negative air units or pushing the air outside to a safe outdoor location. Um, so it's pretty straightforward. Engineering controls in the context of what we do. And it doesn't matter if it's a dust or if it's a gas or a vapor. You're thinking about engineering controls in this manner, source controls and containment controls. This is the language we use with construction contractors. We simplify it and distill it down to this basic um, nature. So illustrating controls through uh, silica examples, um, we deal with cement finishers. All these big high-rise projects here in Vancouver, you can imagine that there's a team of about 12 to 15 cement finishers in that building, grinding, chipping, hammering smoothing out concrete to meet architectural standards. You could be masonry workers, could be roofers. I've got other illustrations around that. And the reason we're concerned about this exposure is because silica, the language we use with construction contractors, at least many of us, again, we distill it down. Um, they, they, it's beyond them to talk about macrophages and all these sort of things, right? They don't ma maintain or retain that. We say, it causes serious and ir irreversible lung disease that um, relates to scarring and thickening of the lung. Like that's how we talk to these construction <laughs> contractors. Um, that's all we want them to take away from the message that we have. Um, you may or may not know that ACGIH and IARC have designations for silica, as, it, as they do for lead, as they do for uh, actually isocyanate's different to sensitizer. But these things all have extremely low exposure limits. The clouds of dust that you see generated from any of these work activities involving silica is a fraction of what's there, right? You know the respirable fraction is a huge or percent than what you see with your visible eye. So if you describe to that construction contractor how many times you breathe, you know, in a minute, and in an hour, and in an eight-hour shift, it kind of provides some perspective on how much dust they might be bringing in. Yeah. Because just the other day, this is on. Can you hear me over there? Um, just the other day, I saw an illustration. It was a new publication. I think it came out of the UK, maybe. But they put a penny and a, like, a, a speck of dust that probably looked like the size of a, a grain of sand. And they said, if you inhaled that one grain of sand throughout your entire shift, you've exceeded the exposure limit for silica. And of course, so it's not that one grain of sand, right? It's full of those microscopic particulate. Yeah, in a smaller amount. Crush it down to a yeah. respirable part, and that's it. You've exceeded the exposure. Limit. And like, if you saw that picture that Anne had up earlier, or even in this picture, like, look at that big cloud. Sure. Very that's... sensitive lung yeah. tissue, right? Very sensitive. Uh, so scanning the industry, uh, you can see this man is a. Uh, stairwells are tricky. Lots of finishing to do in there because they're going to resurface or whatever. So this is probably back in the day when we were starting to do some of our own sampling because it didn't all exist back in the day. Uh, this was definitely one from about 20-some years ago when Ed was still with us. Um, there's histories on these, these, these men, these young workers who were doing this kind of work. Um, uh, floor grinding, there's a lot of concrete that comes off in a floor grinding operation. Tuck point grinding. Listen, all these buildings, these heritage buildings downtown are being restored. Requires repointing the brick and redoing all the masonry work. He, because it's an angle grinder that's technique that's being used, huge amounts of exposure. And these mortars, 30 to 60 percent pure crystalline silica. So the exposures are huge. Um, tons of this renovation, too, needing to put in new service utilities, new plumbing and electrical, uh, cu cutting slab in the basements of these buildings to install these services and whatnot, um, and masonry work. Uh, oh, lots of municipal work. You probably notice all downtown, the, the curbs that are being redone. Uh, 
and the, the roads, and you think of all the road construction and stuff up the coast and all the road scaling and whatnot. So remember we talked about source controls? This is an example of source controls for grinding, for concrete grinding. Um, this is pretty sophisticated, hey, Ed, compared to what we used to have. We used to have wear down issues and all this sort of thing. But the tool manufacturers, Bosch, Makita, all of them, have all kinds of grinders now that have good uh, shrouds. Um, it relies on a proper vacuum cleaner. Uh, this is a vacuum that relies on a, a cyclone or a tangential filtration, which uh, if you get into the industry, you'll learn about all of these things. And I really encourage you to take, take some learning from the construction industry, because it's quick and dirty learning, but it really relates to the, just the application of these principles anywhere. Uh, here's a tuck point grinder. It's got a viewing window, because the Conservancy people require that these guys don't damage this heritage brick that's been it's part of Vancouver's heritage. <laughs> so um, several of the manufacturers have come up with this. 20 years ago, these things did not exist. NIOSH have studied them. We know how, uh, how to make them effective with the right kind of vacuums. Hardy board, 80% of all multifamily construction projects, um, fibrous reinforced board is being put in. The concentrations of crystalline silica in that were upwards of 60 to 90%. They're starting to lower that. But it's, it was huge amounts of exposure for, for, for teams, uh, for workers. But again, Hale-T have responded in a big way, as have other tool manufacturers with circular saws with uh, flexi shrouds on the front and the back of the tool and whatnot. Uh, even drilling. Not that difficult to catch this dust because you're not spinning it, right? You're not accelerating it. So this little tool just takes the mechanical advantage of that turning drill um, and uh, creates enough suction pressure that it pulls that dust down the grabs it, yeah, and pulls it into a, a housing, a dust housing. Vacuum's so important. That filter is not that uncommon to see, and so we're big on vacuums right now. We're shutting vacuums down all over the place. This is probably a multi-stage vacuum. It was a, a vacuum that wasn't working, was taken into Hazmasters. Well, no wonder it wasn't working. You need multi-stages of filtering, at least two stages, presumably three, and more research coming out just now around the efficacy and the comparison of all these vacuums. Yeah. Ed? No, no. Oh, good point. Yeah, really good point. Yeah, that would never happen in this uh, cyclone-style uh, dust control brand vacuum. This is, a re this is the one that's proven the style of vacuum to outperform and maintain uh, capture velocities and suction pressures and flows uh, for day after day after day with heavy industrial and commercial use. Um, so that was source controls using LEV, local exhaust systems. There are also a number of construction tasks that will use water suppression systems. So not very sophisticated engineering control. Um, you don't really have to be too concerned about the amount of water as long as you've got enough water that you're kind of knocking the dust down. Um, so masonry happens that it lubricates the saw, but happens that it's a very effective dust control. Same with this kind of slab cutting. We didn't used to see these with these portables, but we see these a lot now. Um, so those were source controls, uh, LEV controls, water controls. Containment controls sometimes, depending upon the nature of work and the inability to capture the dust effectively at its source, they may need to actually add a combination of a containment or just use a containment. So this is just an illustration of a pop-up structure that we had put up in a construction just to illustrate. You can get telescoping poles. You can get all kinds of job construct systems working here. You can put a negative air unit in there to hoover the dust to reduce the level of uh, PPE that you might need. And a good example of the application of that is a stairwell. So that was the first picture. Um, if uncontrolled stairwell use, you would have exposures orders of magnitude, thousands of times the exposure limit over the course of a shift, tens of thousands, maybe even more. Um, we definitely talk airlines, and even then, the cleanup would be impossible. So for not all stairwells, because it depends on the quality of the forms, but um, we talk about best practices being pulling off between the levels, um, top and bottom, and then the, the risers going up and bottom as well. Um, Hazmasters have great poly seals uh, with zippers and all sorts of things. So it looks like that from the top. It looks like that from the bottom. So you're creating a contained atmosphere, and you're controlling the, fil the discharge, the flow. So it reduces those levels significantly, such that a worker, under this circumstance, even with, with the attempt to use source controls, can maintain a half-face respirator. There's all these other coordination aspects associated with the work that's really important to 
so these trade contractors have to be really skilled at talking to prime contractors about the control that they need of their work environment. They need to understand safe work procedures, uh, training programs. Uh, Robin will talk a little bit more about that. We have some pretty good silica resource tools that have task specific guidance on controls. Uh, we have toolbox meeting guides. You know, these things could all be revised and rewritten and retooled. But uh, for now, at least, Alana, you and I are not sending them stuff from the HSE and from OSHA and NIOSH like we used to. We do have some of our own material, which construction contractors here in BC want construct, they want resource materials that come from their jurisdiction. <laughs> Fair enough. Uh, this would be an example in that silica guidance document of the kind of guidance that we've given, say, around grinding in different circumstances. So let's scan this lead business. This lead business started only about six or seven years ago for us when we had an institutional building in downtown Vancouver undergoing renovation. And um, it, uh, there was a problem with the risk assessment um, because we had all this steel structure, uh, roofing trusses, that had been painted, but they were about 50 years old. And the lead had chalked out of the paint and settled um, as a chalky film all over these things. And we had um, welders, and we had alanum, all these mechanical trades up in those areas, rubbing up against this stuff. There was lead contamination everywhere. So Alana and I were on a huge learning curve, <laughs> weren't we, Alana, <laughs> for a little while. So we're not going to go into the lead stuff in the same detail that we did in, in the silica. Keep in mind, this, the controls are applied in the same way. But imagine how complex this, this project is in terms of assessing the overall scope and, of the work, the specific tasks involved, considering the work locations over water, um, you know, how to get containments around, around this piece. Um, it's complex. And it requires, really requires hygienists who have done their homework. There's lots of great resource materials on this. So there's no reason why you need to be, um, you, you, there's no time to learn on the job, basically, uh, if you're consulting. We've had the opportunity to learn on the job. Um, the big difference between lead work and silica work is that ingestion hazard is a huge issue for lead. Um, it contributes significantly, and lead lead uh, levels and, and the, um, are coming down. The allowable safe levels um, are coming down from some research, a bunch of research that's being done, uh, mostly in the United States, I think. Um, so, and the level for, for lead is already so, so low. It's like 0.05. If it's lead chromate, which it often is, it's 0.015 or something like that. Anyways, and so you can imagine the task on something like this is burning, grinding, abrasive blasting. It's complex. We tell construction workers that, well, Alana likes to <laughs> These reproductive effects can have an influence on young men. <laughs> But it can affect almost every organ in the human body. Um, and also, for construction workers who have little kids at home, we make a special point of raising that awareness. Uh, children five and under are extremely susceptible to these effects of lead. And in fact, as the dose approaches zero coming down, it, there's a spike up. It's a strange phenomenon. Anyways, we, um, we kind of just uh, try to emphasize the best we can in lay terms what that means. Uh, that there's links with carcinogen, carcinogenetic capacity as well, the reproductive hazard. Um, blood lead is really important. We don't compel all construction contractors to do this. We have only required this on big jobs. But that might change. There's a whole rewrite of the lead regs undergoing right now. And we're going to see what happens with, with, the, with the blood lead monitoring. It would certainly be interesting and useful. So just to scan uh, quickly, just briefly, uh, that bridge job. Zooming in on it, this might be what you know a contractor is encountering. Probably it's the whole bridge, but this would be just you know you can only imagine. The Luckily, there are lots of source controls. Hey, I'd like Desco out of California. Uh, you know, needle guns, uh, scabblers, all kinds of things with dust controls on them. So specialized tools for this business, and we do require source controls where they're available, as well as containment controls. Uh, we've had tons of these buildings downtown. So they might have to cut off that, that uh, awning that's got probably 10% uh, lead um, in the content. Uh, there might be a whole exterior refurb, and it's probably all lead paint. Um, the mortar might even have lead in it. The old vintage uh, windows have to be restored. Uh, that's a whole specialized uh, contractor that does that. 
interior walls might have to be demolished. They won't, might want to salvage interior wood. So huge. Risk assessment, really, really big, right? Like you can see how risk assessment is so important for lead work compared to, say, even asbestos work, right? Asbestos work is kind of task-specific controls, kind of like silica. Lead is really a different thing altogether. And it could be like BC Rail uh, or schools. There's been lots of work done on restoring. All our institutional buildings, right, are getting to be 40, 50, 60 years old, and they all need to be uh, restored. And don't forget residential. We don't have time. We don't have the strategies to get in there. But residential issues around lead, they could maybe just be burning paint off a fireplace mantle and can seriously causing harm to their child if they're living there. We have some good resources. Jeff Clark, our senior officer, has been great with helping us put together some of these things that are very, very uh, useful for construction contractors to get the hang of how to think about and characterize their work in terms of containment controls, in terms of task-specific controls. So there's a lot of that sort of thing. So just zooming in, I think, Alana, this isn't the Granville Street project, but even the Granville Street, they're, they're replacing bearings because those they're about 40, 50 years old and having to replace PCB. And in order to get in there, they have to go through all these lead-painted uh, structures. And so zooming in, you might see decontamination facilities because if it's a high-risk lead job, that's what you need. Uh, you know, this kind, of, this kind of thing inside. OK, so uh, Robin's going to take over and um, use the uh, controls approach to talk about isocyanates. Do you want to switch the mic? Okay, is it okay you can hear me? Okay, I have to congratulate Anne because she just compressed maybe 20 years of experience into 20 minutes and <laughs> flew through all of that. So I'm going to speak at a slower tone because I only have two years of experience with the boards. <laughs> but, uh, I'll try and do my best. So the next hazard that we're going to get into that's common in the construction industry is called isocyanates. And isocyanates, they have so many different isomer ver like, uh, variations of isocyanates. Um, they're commonly found in two-part products. So there's usually a part A and a part B, and you, you mix the two together to get your final product. Um, and oftentimes, a part A could be 100% isocyanate containing, and the part B would have some other, uh, another mixture of amines and solvents. Um, they, they usually use this as a weatherproofing type of material. So they'll put them on decking outdoors to protect like water ingress, or in the parkades, in underground parking garage, they'll put that as a sealant over the concrete. And uh, in spray foam, so you can see that in the picture there. That's spray foaming uh, the interior of a home or of a building, usually on the exterior walls, to, to, to maintain that insulation for uh, heat, right? And it's a, it's a very powerful irritant, and it's also a sensitizer. And I'll, I'll get into a little bit more about sensitizers after I talk about the isocyanates. But they can get absorbed through the skin and also the uh, particulate or the, the any... Uh, yeah, mostly the particulate, if they're spraying, um, they can inhale that. So it has a dual sensitization, which makes it very powerful, because there's the two ways, the skin and inhalation. And Alana has another statistic on this, but 1 in 20 people become sensitized to isocyanates. And there's another one about uh, occupational asthma. Was that 1 in 6? Occupational asthma from the isocyanates. So when we go to sites and, and isocyanate is a product that's being used, there's very low tolerance. So we enforce that very strictly and ensure that they have the exposure control plan in place. And I'll come back to that. So that's the sensitization. So these are the symptoms that you're looking for to determine whether you've been sensitized or not. And we talk about sensitization. When I speak to um, the construction contractors in an industry, I describe it as an allergy. It's like getting an allergic reaction to something when you say sensitized. So you get sore eyes, runny nose, um, sore throat, coughing, some wheezing, and then that's the, the early signs of asthma. And with sensitization, the more and more you become exposed to it, the more and more severe your reaction becomes. And it doesn't take a lot of exposure to, to release that reaction. And it could be someone who doesn't even work with the product. They just happen to be working on a site. So on a site, you have the applicators, the direct users of the product, but then you have other trades, right? So the uh, plumbers, the electricians, and they might just be in the area. And if those applicators don't have their controls in place, 
then those, one, those other trades are being exposed without even knowing it. Okay, so I have a video. I gotta remember how to click it. It's a video that's off of our WorkSafe uh, BC website, and there's two videos on there. I just picked one. The one that I picked was um, for deck, I think it was for Parkade. I don't have the play button on there. It doesn't show up. Oh, okay. Yeah. Oh. I had to use this. this one. The application of insulating foams and finish coatings can present serious hazards for workers. These products contain reactive chemicals called isocyanates. Short-term exposure can cause irritation or burns to the eyes, nose, throat, and skin. Prolonged exposures can cause a much more serious condition known as isocyanate asthma. The vapors released when rolling or spraying can enter a worker's body through unprotected skin, the mouth, and nose. <coughs> the air passages or tubes that carry air into and out of the lungs are affected. During an asthma attack, these tubes narrow, become inflamed, and may be blocked by mucus, restricting the amount of air that flows in and out of the lungs. Workers that become sensitized or allergic to isocyanates can have an asthma attack even if the airborne concentration is very small. This sensitization is permanent, and in rare cases, these attacks can be fatal. <coughs> to prevent exposure to isocyanates, you must be properly protected. Workers rolling isocyanate-based coatings should wear appropriate chemically resistant gloves and at least a half-face cartridge respirator. In all cases, the work area must be well ventilated. For more information, contact WorkSafeBC.com. Okay, so that's one of the isocyanate videos we have. We also have another one that talks about the spray foam that I was talking about for uh, insulation. So here's a worker who's dressed to do that spray foam application. <clears throat> and you can see the blue product on the ground. It doesn't show so blue on the screen here, but it's usually a bright color, bright blue, green, purple. And sometimes it's just yellow or like a beige tone. <clears throat> but he's dressed in his uh, chemical resistant suit. He has the gloves on. And he, what he's holding under his arm is an air, an air fed respirator. That's because he's spraying the product. In the, in the video, they were just wearing the filter cartridges because they were rolling on and not creating an air solemn to the air, but with spraying they are, so the respiratory protection for that needs to be stepped up quite a bit. <clears throat> this is what it looks like in a truck of the spray foam application. So like I said, there was a two-part A and B. So one drum would have an A and, and another drum would have a B, and the product gets mixed from the truck into the line, so it comes out as one application. Here's someone who's not so well protected for what he's doing, right? He doesn't even have a chemical resistant suit on, so he's got gonna have some skin exposure and then the respir he's, respirator that he has on is nowhere near adequate. I've been to a site before, I should have put that picture in here, but I've seen a worker, he wasn't spraying, he was rolling the deck on the membrane and he had it all over the forearms. And he had a young worker with him who was maybe 22, kind of just came out of the, from Afghanistan, he was out of the army, and they had it all over their arm and this was a repeat um, occurrence with this employer having exposed their workers to isocyanate. Um, and that has serious repercussions. If an employer is repeatedly exposing their workers to that, uh, they can get fined because following the exposure limit is, is or protecting workers from that is a law, really. So here's some more of the insulation. You can see the on the walls there. And this is the decking. This almost looks like a site at UBC. It is UBC. It's UBC. So this is out here on campus. <laughs> 
Well, these guys are protected and they would have coordinated, as Anne was saying, whoever was in charge of the project would have coordinated it so that no other workers were around on site and they would have had it a good um, barrier range on the outside to protect public who would be walking by on sidewalks. So you got to check your MSDS sheets for isocyanates. Just like I said, they come in so many variations and different isomers of isocyanates. So just when you scan an MSDS, just look for anything that says isocyanate. Even if it's part of another word or it sounds all mumble jumble words you can't read, just look for isocyanate and then you know it's in there. So the odor threshold. Sometimes when I see workers, the ones that are, that are doing the, the roll-on application that have the filter cartridge, and I ask them, um, how often do you replace their filter? I say, when I start to smell it. Well, that doesn't work for isocyanate because the odor threshold for that is higher than the exposure limit. So it doesn't work. If they tell me that, I know that they haven't been trained adequately and um, that they're probably being overexposed if that's what they're using. Other, sol other uh, contents like solvents, they have very low uh, odor thresholds. So you can smell them way before you become overexposed. And sometimes we get the reverse complaints where there's xylene or toluene and they complain about um, being exposed to that because they can smell it and they start to feel sick. And you know, they, they describe all these symptoms, but really they're, they're likely nowhere near the exposure limit for something like that. So this is, again, just some studies that have been done um, to show that you know, the isocyanates are sensitizers that they can cause, yeah, lead to uh, occupational asthma, uh, done out of uh, the States and OSHA. And so the, the exposure that a worker is going to experience with the isocyanate relies mostly on control. So again, sometimes when a, uh, an employer tells me, oh, we'll just monitor them, and if the monitoring shows, you know, that there's some exposure, then we'll put in their controls. I'm like, okay, well, do you want, you can go ahead, hire a consultant for three to $5,000 to do this monitoring for you, or you can just put your controls in, right? It's not, it's not, and exposure limit for isocyanates are so low, the chances of you even being able to detect it with the monitoring and sampling technology that is available are, are pretty slim and may not be reliable. Okay, so now we can get into the second part where we talk about exposure control plans. And the acronym for this is ECP, so I'm just going to keep saying ECP for ex exposure control plan. So I'll just quickly um, we'll say what it is, when do you need one, exposures, controls, uh, how the plan should look. So exposure control plan, if you Google that phrase, you're not going to find too much uh, related to what the board, um, this, how the board deals with exposure control plan. Most of what you're going to find is things related to bloodborne pathogens in healthcare. And that's typically seen nationwide or maybe internationally. That's where exposure control plan is found. At the board, we have a definition for what exposure control plan is. And it's, uh, I'll just read it. Written explanation of the work procedure and other controls that will be used to reduce the worker's risk of exposure. So it's that simple. Just break it down. You have exposure to some substance X. You need to have controls for it and have a plan on how you're going to use the control to reduce exposure. And it's just a written out document that we look for when we go to site. Uh, so when do you need one? Here's two cases on when you'll need one. If, the, if you're going to be exceeding 50% of the exposure limit, which you know is the action level, then you need one, regardless of what uh, contaminant it is. The other case that you need one is if it's a designated substance. So I'll explain what the designated substances are. So let's say you have a case where you don't know what exposure is or it's not possible or practical to measure what exposure is to figure out if you're at that 50% level or not. And that's the third criteria Then you also need to have an exposure control plan. So just quickly, the four routes of exposure you're all familiar with. When it comes to exposure limits, it's the inhalation route of exposure that, that you focus on. And that's what all the exposure limits are based on. So here's a snapshot of the table of exposure limits out of um, WorkSafeBC's website. Most of these exposure limits are identical to what you would see from ACGIH in their publication. But on the inside, if you, if you have that ACGIH book, on the inside of that cover, it says these uh, exposure limits are just recommendations or guidelines. They are not legal standards. But because WorkSafe has adapted those limits, they are actually legal. So if you do not, um, so if employers are exposing workers to anything that you find on, on this table, that is a legal requirement. 
even though it was adapted from ACGIH. Then on this column here, right, what are those? Those are the, the symbols that are used to identify designated substances. So for designated substances, one of them would be a carcinogen. If it's a carcinogenic substance, it's considered designated. Um, so you, you know from IARC and ACGH, they have the different symbols that they use, like A1, A2, or 1, 2, B. So that's when it's a carcinogen. So that would be asbestos, uh, benzene, and carcinogens. And then reproductive toxins, like lead, like Alana uses at sites with the young men and tells them about the reproduction, uh, the reproductive hazard for that. And other, other heavy metals as well, like mercury or manganese, are also going to be reproductive toxins. And designated substance as um, sensitizers. So that's like isocyanate, something that can cause an allergic reaction. And another one that's really common everywhere is latex. That's actually a designated substance because it's sensitized. A lot of people have latex allergies. So on the chart of our uh, table of exposure limits, there will be an S in that far column next to latex or next to isocyanate. So for designated substances, there is, again, like I'm saying before with isocyanate, there's no tolerance. We don't, um, we don't give a lot to the worker when they're dealing with a, or to the employer when they're dealing with a designated substance. So the ALERA principle comes in, which is to keep that exposure as low as reasonably achievable. And to do that, that's when you're going to use the exposure control plan as your tool. Now, one thing I, I noticed when I started going to sites is sometimes you forget about the exposure shift. So what happens when you go from an eight-hour shift to a 10-hour shift? The exposure limit comes down, right? Or a 10-hour to 12-hour. The exposure limit's going to come down. So maybe if you were doing an eight-hour shift, you, you were nowhere near the 50%, and you wouldn't need an exposure control plan. But if you know, the schedule's gotten tight and you need to work extra, you're putting in longer hours, now you're doing 12-hour shifts, you're going to start to think about whether or not you need to implement an exposure control plan then, because your exposure limit has gone down to a quarter of what it used to be. So looking at an MSDS sheet, um, you're going to look for anything that you can see that stands out as a carcinogen, as a reproductive toxin, or as a sensitizer. So on this one, it says carcinogenicity. Carcinogenicity is possible cancer hazard. And that's because of the ethyl benzene that's in here. You're going to need an exposure control plan, regardless of um, the exposure limit there. So now we're getting to the controls. So the plan, so you, you know, so you just need to recognize the exposure. Once you've done that, you've got to start thinking about what controls you're going to do now. What controls are you going to need? And as Anne said, they have a requirement to go through the hierarchy of controls. And in construction, Again, elimination and substitution is not so much of an option as the other controls are. So once you've uh, selected the controls that, all, that Anne's talked about, the source controls, the containment controls, whatever you've come up with, you need to have it written out and put it together in your plan. This plan has come from Regulation 5.54, and you'll find it listed out just like this in seven subsections. So there's uh, seven parts to putting your plan together. This is, these are required elements. So every plan needs to contain these parts. I like to focus on part B and part D as the meat and potatoes, because that's where all of your effort's really going to go. If you don't have the meat and potatoes, your plan is going to be probably inefficient, faulty. So you need to focus on work procedures and on your assessment and your controls. Now one thing about the way it's written in our regulation is don't be fooled by the grouping of how controls just at the end of you know, part B and plan makes it look like it has less importance. When I talked to another officer who's been with the board for 30 years, he said the only reason why it's done like this is because there was a seven-part um, subsection limit on writing regulations. No regulation is going to have more than seven subsections to it. Otherwise, there would have been ten. Okay, there's ten. There's actually ten parts in there. Right? Responsibilities, assessment, and control. So don't give those a lower uh, priority or value. They're just as important as everything else. And every control plan needs to be reviewed annually. And that's because you could have changes to uh, an exposure limit. There could be changes to technology that's out there for your control. And there could be changes to um, the MSDS, or the product, the composition of the products that you're using. So the first one of purpose, I'll skim through these really quick because we're running out of time. So the purpose is a very simple statement. It's usually one or two sentences why you have an exposure control plan. And every role on a site is going to have um, 
different responsibilities on what they need to do to carry out that plan. It needs to be developed and implemented and then maintained. So everyone has a different role. An example of a worker's role would be that they need to know the hazard, they need to follow um, the procedure that's been provided to them and use the equipment that's been given to control their exposure. Need to assess that. So some work activities have higher or lower exposure than others and consider the duration of exposure. And your risk controls, again, following the hierarchy. Education and training is very important. Like I said, when a worker tells me, I just changed my cartridge when I can smell it, I know that the education and training hasn't been very effective. And so the things that a worker would need to be trained in would be the plan itself, how to use the controls, how to wear their respirator properly, and um, how to get first aid and report exposure when they do get that. Now, work procedures, a good thing to, that I've been told once is a work procedure should be written out that you could walk in off the street and know what to do. It needs to be that detailed. And also it needs to be written at the right level. So someone with a, maybe a grade 8 level of education should be able to understand what they need to do when they look at work procedures. And then decontamination, how to decontaminate yourself and clean any product that you've got on your skin, hair, wherever. Um, and like the ingestion with the lead, make sure you've cleaned, washed your hands before you go for a smoke break or a coffee and lunch. And then some will need health monitoring, um, maybe chest x-rays for silica or asbestos type of exposures. And the employer needs to document all of this information. They need to keep records that they've done fit testing for a worker. They need to keep records that they've done their training and who's being exposed, records of the equipment that they've purchased or um, maintained, the, of their maintenance of their vacuums for the local source control. And sometimes when you go to a site and you ask for the exposure control plan, this is might, might be all that you see. This is the one pager, this is what we're doing and this is how we're going to control it. And that's fine, it's effective. And as long as they've also got their um, complete um, plan written out somewhere else, but on, on site it's just more practical to kind of have that because they can review it in the morning before they start their shift as a toolbox talk and say, this is what we're doing today and this is how we're going to control it. Very simple and effective. <clears throat> and then when you come to develop like the full package, uh, if you work for an employer and you need to create one, or if you become a consultant, um, the process to go through when you want to develop an exposure control plan is look at the resources that we have online. We actually have templates and samples. Just cut and paste from there, put in your employer and whatever hazard you've got, and combine your uh, research that you've done on, on the controls that you're going to use. And so this is just a snapshot of a template or a sample on how to de develop your own plan. This one was for silica, and it's on our website. It's a Word document, so you can uh, change it up to suit whatever you need to do. There you go. That was it. Hey. <laughs> Oh, thank you so much, Anne and Robin. That was really terrific. Um, always interesting to hear about an industry where there are tons of hazards. <laughs> I was really, <clears throat> I wanted to ask about the isocyanate um, uh, surfacing for concrete. I was surprised first when I saw the slide of them pouring it onto the ground instead of maybe using a roller. And then I was even more surprised when I saw that same operation being done by spray when it could clearly be done not by spray. So I'm curious about is there, it seemed like there were better ways to do it than both those um, operations. And I wonder, do you ever guide people about what operation to use uh, to apply something? That whole industry is shifting so quickly, the membrane industry, that the one that uh, Robin showed out there, that product is actually being heated as well. So um, we do talk to them about application techniques and stuff, but it seems like the, the industry is evolving so quickly and the, the chemical composition of all of these membranes is evolving. And there are particular application techniques that um, seem to uh, work better or are essential, actually, for these products to be penetrated properly and uh, set up properly. So we talk to them about that, but and we require them to convince us that 
that this application is the only one that be con considered. Of course, obviously, if a spray application is being used, they need so much greater distance, say it's an outdoor location. Oftentimes, it'll be scheduling that work after hours where there's no other trade contractors around. So there's these layers of control that need to be added on to it when, in fact, circumstances are that they need to uh, carry that work out in a manner that could potentially create much significantly higher exposure levels. But yeah, the, 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 these isocyanates are shifting. We can't even keep track of it. We actually had someone in our organization take a look at all these. Because like Robin said, you'll see MSDS sheets, but the ISO will be kind of combined with other things or pre-polymerized. And, and the health research just hasn't been done yet for all of that. So we've just distilled it down to say, we know how to work with isocyanates. We feel properly. You're going to follow that, um, even though you're saying that this product is functioning very differently. We need you to do that until the health research or the exposure data is there for us. So actually, there was some uh, a new resource that came out not that long ago that talked about, uh, at least it was for officers. I'm not sure it was available for yeah, the industry at general, sure. just explaining all of these different uh, formulations uh, related to these products. So I understand what you're saying. Uh, in terms of application technique, because it really is, it does make a huge difference, right? If you can um, uh, trowel it on, and that's usually what they do in parkades. But that is usually an epoxy, actually. It's not often an isocyanate. It can be an isocyanate. But so it seems like there's very particular application techniques. There's more of these things being used for for um, ca causeway upgrades, like concrete, right? Under like the, um, the, vi the viaducts and uh, the tunnels, but these injection. Uh, systems that require to be heated so they can get the viscosity to move in through through and up cracks and stuff like that. So uh, we're it's just an explosion of isocyanate products that are out there that we're we're it's a moving target for us right now. Yeah, I'd like to share some experience from way back when I was a factory inspector, back in the '70s. Uh, that was I think when the first isocyanate paints were being introduced into the market in BC. <clears throat> I was going around inspecting auto body shops and talking to painters about the health risks of being a painter. And they, they told me about isocyanates without actually using the name. And one guy telling me he'd tried this new kind of paint just to paint the fender on a truck outdoors. And eight hours later, he was having a, a really serious asthma attack. From the first exposure, painting a small amount of, a relatively small area with an isocyanate type paint. So it, it doesn't take a lot of exposure if you're the unlucky guy that's they're quite susceptible to isocyanates. You can have that major asthma attack first time you're exposed. Um, and yeah, it's those isocyanates that were listed on the slides there, all of those were in use back in the 1970s. And manufacturers were telling us then, oh, they're all pre-polymerized. There's virtually no isocyanate in the air. It's not really hazardous at all. Uh, it was the same old bullshit. I guess it's still going around. So, yeah. Actually, now they say this is low VOC, neighborhood friendly. I'm like, yeah, yeah, yeah let me see the MS. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yes. I don't believe you. No. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> I don't and, think and the hazard level of the products has changed much. And it's Elena's. She's the she's the researcher on our team, actually. And, uh, yeah. There was that new health study research that's come out that's talking about that significant increase in occupational uh, adult occupa onset occupational uh, asthma. Right, Elena? Or uh, onset adult asthma that is. Primarily, they're contributing to occupational exposures, and a significant portion of that, they're, they believe, are associated with these kind of products. Yeah. Thanks so much for that. Um, I was just wondering if um, you find, when you're trying to educate supervisors and workers, what the reception is, because I know traditionally the construction industry has somewhat of a reputation for being not super. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. OK, so with that, you, you do see that, right? They have the macho approach. Oh, they don't really care. They don't think they're going to get sick. Whatever. And really, when you try and sell that approach, it doesn't work. What works is when you use um, money or production as a motivator. So for example, with the silica grinding, if they're not using source controls, they get dust everywhere. They're going to have to hire someone else just to clean up. So that's using an extra resource and manpower. So if you tell them, well, if you control it before it gets everywhere, you don't have to waste time cleaning or uh, money on hiring someone to do the cleanup. Another one is like Alana used before is your family, right? Going back home, bringing lead to your young children, it's going to affect their development and um, mental status. You've just brought up a point that's really important for hygienists, though, and that is um, the way that we communicate and the soft skills that we use. 
so much a part of our job is soft skills. And Alana and I, we laugh because we say, you know, oftentimes we don't even have to talk about the exposure hazard anymore. They know what they're not doing. And so it's just like, why, my friend, have you not brought your A game today, you know? Like that's all we need to do as a practicing hygienist is like, where's your A game? <laughs> it's funny how we talk to them. But it's also being very particular in the way that you communicate. And it's kind of putting them in a position where they can't squeeze into that lower place. Do you know what I mean? Just having them rise through through also having them communicate with you in a particular way about that. It's it's subtle, but you'll you'll experience that. Hi, great presentation. I have a couple questions from from online online audience. So the first one is where can we find the more guidance um, guidance information on medical and health monitoring? I think our op doctors, right? They would be a good source for that. Our occupational doctors at WorkSafe BC. I've had to talk, I've, um, before when I was consulting, I had I written a biological monitoring program for a client. And I contacted WorkSafe BC as an external person and through an occupational doctor, and he provided his uh, support and guidance for that. We do have, I think we have some guidelines. I understand the person's question, the, the uh, participant's question. Um, that aspect, as I understand it, of the regulation was never exactly promulgated in a particular way. Uh, however, the silica regs and the, the lead regs are being reviewed and they're out for um, third party, I guess, review um, pretty soon. <laughs> and uh, medical monitoring is on, on the agenda for discussion, so it'll be interesting to see what comes back from industry. Um, but there was a guideline, at least, that was available to us that said, that talked about, say, for example, biological monitoring, medical monitoring, where there's a value for it in terms of uh, catching an exposure before it becomes a, a disease condition, where there can be some intervention. Um, but I'm not... In, 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 the, in lead, uh, I think in part six of the regulation for lead specifically, it does get into a little bit more of that in the guideline. But that was for lead, so I think it'd be different depending on which contaminant you're... You're going to be working with, yeah. And they can call. They can call us, and if we can't help them out. We'll, we have a lot of resources at the board, right? So next question is: Is there um, potential for isocyanate exposure when removing spray foam insulation, or is unreacted unre isocyanate unlikely? That's one of the issues if they don't know what they're doing in applying the spray foam is if it's not done correctly, it won't um, polymerize. And so you have unreacted product, which is um, going to be active so you can get sensitized to it. And it's sort of like a, a gooey mess. And so it will continue to um, off gas and be mm -hmm. toxic. Alana was just in Montreal and she met with uh, our colleagues at the IRSST um, and brought some takeaways uh, home for us to discuss on the construction team. So hopefully we can provide more resources to the industry that will be really useful in the future. But I, th I think once the isocyanate spray foam product has been applied correctly and let's say it's been there for a few years and <clears throat> it's hardened and cured, if you were to cut and remove that, I don't think there is an isocyanate exposure. Unless you heat it. So like a, well, a plumber, if there was, we had an instance before where there was a pipeline going right beside a previously uh, applied um, spray foam application. And when, uh, I can't remember what he was doing, soldering, I think, on, along the pipe. And so that heat um, caused the foam to go on fire. And then it just sent eight fire trucks out <laughs> to that. Luckily, it didn't get too far in that instance. But, yeah, it could become flammable. So, okay, so the last question is, could you speak about the difference between the corporate style sending ECPs and the site-specific, task-specific ECPs? What's the difference between those? So the corporate, uh, maybe more generic. So think of a contractor who does grinding, chipping, um, jackhammering, and, and all that. So it's more broad um, exposure control plan where it kind of includes different 
a whole variety of controls for a whole variety of different tasks. And then the site specific would be one set specific to that site, to that layout, um, to their containment kind of orientation, and to whatever tasks are happening at that site, what controls are happening at that site. And then the generic one would be, you can draw from it to create your site specific one. So the, the corporate wide one would have all these options and different um, controls for different tasks. And when you create your site specific one, you could just pick maybe two or three